Now, WSAV is proud to present Honoring Black History. Sharing our stories, here is Kim Gusby. Welcome, and thank you for joining us for WSAV's Honoring Black History special. I'm Kim Gusby. Today, we pay homage to some of the people and places that have played a significant role in shaping our community and even our country, inspiring future generations along the way. We begin with the story of a woman who has become the matriarch of a national celebration. She's known as the grandmother of Juneteenth, but Miss Opal Lee isn't your typical nonagenarian. Though small in stature, Miss Opal, as she's affectionately called, has always stood tall in her convictions. During a visit to Savannah, I had a chance to sit down with her at First Tabernacle Missionary Baptist Church, where she spoke of her life, both the challenges and accomplishments. In 2016, at the tender age of 89, Miss Opal Lee embarked on a mission to make Juneteenth a national holiday. Freedom means freedom for everybody, not just black folk or Texas. Freedom for everybody. And we ain't free yet. Walking from Fort Worth, Texas to Washington, D.C., the retired teacher and lifelong community activist gained momentum and support along the way. I had this itch that maybe at 89, maybe 90, I hadn't done enough. So my team gave me the send off from Baker Chapel African Methodist Episcopal Church. And I was to walk from Fort Worth to Washington, D.C., 1,400 miles. It didn't happen. Don't know about it. I don't know about to think I walked 1,400 miles. I didn't. But it started off that way. I walked two and a half miles. I'd take up where I left off, and I walked Fort Worth, Arlington, Grand Prairie, Dallas, Box Springs. People were so nice to me. Oh, they got me from place to place. Sweetport, somebody took me to Texarkana, somebody took me to Little Rock, uh, St. Louis, Denver, Colorado Springs, Atlanta. I was all over the place. We had asked President Obama to walk with us from the Frederick Douglass House to the Capitol. He was in Chicago. I didn't get what I wanted. But P. Diddy helped me with a million five hundred thousand signatures that we took to Congress. And we were prepared to take that many more when we got the call to go to the White House. The culmination of a lifelong effort came to fruition in 2022 when Miss Opal stood beside President Joe Biden as he signed the Juneteenth National Independence Day Act into law, commemorating the emancipation of enslaved people in the United States. Oh, I was overwhelmed. I was joyful. I, I still pinch myself sometimes to see if it was really true. To be there with the president and the vice president and the legislatures, that's what I could have done the whole day. She's now recognized the world over, but that certainly isn't where her story began. Born at the turn of the 19th century in Marshall, Texas, Miss Opal and her family settled in Fort Worth. For as long as she can remember, Juneteenth had always brought her family and community together. But in 1939, it nearly tore them apart when a racist mob forced them out of their home. On the 19th, people began to gather around the house. And the paper says it was 500 of them. And the police were there and they couldn't control the mob. My dad came with a gun. Police told him if he busted a cap, he would have done it. They let the mob have us. So my parents sent us to friends several blocks away. <clears throat> and um, they left on the cover of darkness. Those people who drove the furniture out, they did despicable things. Uh, our parents never ever discussed it with us. Never, ever. And they work like Trojans, they bought another home. Those days are long gone, 
and with wisdom and wit, Miss Opal has managed to achieve the unimaginable. I keep telling people, we can't rest on our laurels. There are too many other things that need to be attended to. And I'm talking about joblessness and homelessness and health care that some of us can get and others can't. And climate change that we are responsible for. And so I'm going to keep on walking and talking until somebody listens. Her travels have taken her through many cities across the country, including Savannah where her sorority sisters of Zeta Phi Beta welcomed her with open arms. Last year, Mayor Van Johnson presented her with the key to the city. Plans are now in the works for a National Juneteenth Museum in her hometown. Meanwhile, Miss Opal continues to make headlines. In 2022, she was nominated for a Nobel Prize, and in 2023, she was honored as the second black woman to have her portrait hung in the Texas Senate chamber. I'm going around telling young people, and I mean everybody, to make themselves a committee of one, to change somebody's mind. We know people who are on the same page we own, change their mind because if people can be taught to hate, they can be taught to love. And like her name, Miss Opal is a jewel, a national treasure whose efforts and footprints have created the path for generations to come. What do you want people to know about you? <laughs> <laughs> that she was an old lady in tennis shoes, getting in everybody's business and having a good time doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and changing the world by doing it. Now at 97, more than 80 years after she was forced to leave her family's Texas home, Miss Opal has been gifted that same land from Habitat for Humanity, a national nonprofit that builds affordable housing in communities across the country. The organization has also decided to construct a home for her on that same lot. It's interesting to note that according to Savannah's Daughters of Mary Magdalene, Savannah was originally a stop on Miss Opal's march to the White House. But because of Hurricane Matthew, that leg of her trip was canceled. It's also worth mentioning that the late Ronald Myers was the original driving force behind the effort. He was the chair of the National Association of Juneteenth Lineage. In 1997, the organization was instrumental in getting Congress to pass legislation recognizing Juneteenth as Juneteenth Independence Day in America which paved the way for 43 states and the District of Columbia to create some form of Juneteenth celebration. Sadly, he passed away before he could see his plans come to fruition. But we are fortunate that his legacy lives on. Have you heard of Harris Neck in McIntosh County? If you haven't, you're not alone. What happened to this once thriving African-American community? We'll tell you about this little known piece of coastal empire black history when we come back. Welcome back. While Opal Lee has regained the land that her family once owned, many black families across the country are fighting to keep the property that has been passed down to them for generations. The Harris Neck community in Townsend, Georgia is a prime example. Just down the road, about an hour from Savannah, lies the unincorporated town of Harris Neck in McIntosh County. It's home to the smallest church in America and a national wildlife refuge. But there is a little known history about this hamlet, once a thriving community. The land deeded to a former slave in 1865 by a plantation owner. Wilson Moran is a direct descendant of Harris Neck. If these trees could talk, I wouldn't have to tell my story. Many of his ancestors, including his mother and grandmother, are buried here in Gould Cemetery, one of the only remaining sites of what once was. After the Civil War, black families settled in the area and thrived. This sketch depicts what his grandmother's house looked like. They lived a great uh, life. They had a great plan, one success after another. For more than 80 years, it was home to a prosperous, autonomous, close-knit town of more than 75 African-American families. We had our own school. We had our own fire department. 
we had our own judge, Judge Lowe, uh, Winston Rolliford, another cousin of mine, his uh, great-grandfather. Uh, we had two churches. Business-wise, we were expert at uh, fishing, shrimp, crabs, oyster, plus my grandfather, they were farmers. But in the summer of 1942, everything changed. During World War II, the federal government, by means of eminent domain, forcibly seized Harris Neck, more than 2,600 acres, to build an army airfield. How I was told by my grandparents was that in 1942, the war was going on the World War II. And uh, the German U-boats were blowing up the merchant ships coming out of Jacksonville, coming out of uh, Brunswick, uh, Savannah, and Charleston. And the military uh, needed a place in which they could combat these U-boats uh, with their planes. Um, the local power structure having a problem with us because we were too successful led them to Harris Neck, even though there were a lot of land that was uh, uninhabited all around us. Moran says residents were given just two weeks to move. Crops, houses, buildings, and businesses destroyed, leaving them to fend for themselves. I should note that some of the people of the 77 families couldn't move fast enough, so their homes were either bulldozed or burned down. They had to get out, but they had no place to go either. This is my grandmother, Amelia Dolly who I was born in her house and never left. Many of them, like Moran's family, relocated to a nearby area under the false promise that the property would be returned to them after the war. We have moved out here right next door. Uh, they had to do a lean-to shack because my mom was very pregnant with me. So that means in this little lean-to shack was my grandmother, my grandfather, my mother, my father, my uncle, Pastor Robert Thorpe, my brother, Rayfield, my other brother, Roosevelt, and my sister, Amelia, and then I came. Uh, they were separated from what I understand by blankets, but they all, they cooked on the outside. Uh, there was a difficult time for them. Their land was never given back. Instead, the then War Department gave Harris Neck to McIntosh County. In 1945 or whatever, uh, black people had no say in the government, so we didn't even know they returned the land back to the county. Then the county officials then took the land and uh, with the promise that it was going to make a uh, a uh, airport out of it, but that's not what they did. Uh, they, oh wow. On the runways, whether it's, uh, they made a race, a racing track. I uh, wanted the houses, they made it a house of prostitution. And um, one of the uh, county commissioners, uh, placed his cow on the land, his cows on the land, because 2,687 acres of land, uh, for a dollar a year. In 1961, the federal government took it back and gave it to the Department of Interior. From 1962 to the present, the land has been a national wildlife refuge. It's now been 81 years, leaving Moran to wonder if that promise will ever come to pass. It's a difficult thing uh, to to deal with, but it is what it is. Only thought I can think of uh, why uh, they haven't uh, given us the land back is racism. I'm not gonna name names, but we've worked with many members of Congress and the Senate, and I just think it's cowardice. They don't, they don't want to tackle this. David Kelly moved to Harris Neck from California more than two decades ago after hearing about their plight on NPR radio. This story just struck me. I don't I don't know what it was. It just so when I heard it, I went to my office the next day. I printed out the um, uh, the transcript and I was writing a book, which was a compilation of all the radio, some of the radio interviews like 
you know, I interviewed the Dalai Lama and Al Gore and stuff. So I wanted to put those into a book format. I just thought it would make. And then this story came along and I put that on the shelf and have never returned to it. Kelly is now the executive director of the Harris Neck Land Trust, an organization formed in 2005 for the sole purpose of achieving justice, they say, is long overdue. So we have a top-notch advisory board and then the trust. I'm the only outsider, so I'm just a staff person. So the trust is made up completely of Harris Neck people. There's nobody in the trust who is not an elder, well the elders are gone, or a descendant. And now there's, let's see, uh, four generations, I think, since the elders. Through the years, their story has garnered attention around the nation and around the world, from the London Times to the New York Times. In 1983, CBS's Mike Wallace aired a segment on 60 Minutes, and just last year it was featured in the Hulu series The 1619 Project with Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Nicole Hannah-Jones. They've been from the courts to Congress, but have still gained very little traction. That's where it went first in 1979 and 80. It went to the courts. And a federal district judge who's still alive had a um, hearing in Brunswick, and they said, there's no legal um, remedy for this. It has to be done by Congress. The trust is seeking the title to 500 of the now more than 2,800 refuge acres. Their next plan is to petition the president. Many refuges in the United States, including the very first one down in Florida, created by Teddy Roosevelt, 1903. Many refuges have been created, modified, and closed by executive order, many. All we want is President Biden to sign a one-page executive order which returns 500 acres in the very eastern segment of Harris Neck. What we're after is just simple restorative justice, and so we use the word restitution. But no matter what you call it, Mr. Moran says he just wants someone to make it right. Maybe someone um, with the power to help us to get our land back. Um, and somebody who is strong enough to stand up and say, okay, we did them wrong, let's let them, let's make a difference. Let's give them their land back. There's a lot to unpack when it comes to Harris Neck. This is just merely an attempt to continue to bring to light an injustice that still persists today. Aside from two location markers, one for the community's original school, the other for the original church, which was relocated when residents were pushed out, there's no mention of the history of Harris Neck in the area or the events of 1942. If the property is returned, the Land Trust hopes to build homes and a living history museum that would bring visitors back to 1900 Harris Neck. The plans include a welcome center, a Rosenwald schoolhouse replica, a Gullah Geechee Cafe, an Oyster House Museum, and open-air seafood and farmer's market. While we are just beginning to shed light on the injustices of Harris Neck, one Gullah Geechee group from Townsend continues to shine, the critically acclaimed original McIntosh County Ring Shouters. The collective continues to be keepers of the ancestral heritage, using the traditional Gullah Ring Shout to tell stories that describe their way of life. They share this experience with audiences across the country and in our area, including these students at McIntosh Middle School. McIntosh County Shouters is a group made up of family members. We are all blood related, offspring of London and Amy Jenkins. This is something my grandmother taught us way back. And that was one of our highlight at the time. We could have stay out all night. We go to the shout Christmas Eve. New Year's Eve, we'd be out all night <laughs> watching them singing those songs and shouting. That was something to see. Now, in case you're wondering what ring shouting is, Brenton Jordan describes it this way. A non-academic description would be a, a cultural and spiritual as well as communal um, form of communication between the practitioners and God 
the practitioners and their ancestors and the coming together of our community. In 1993, the original Macintosh Shouters were named National Endowment for the Arts Fellows. And for more than three decades, the Smithsonian Institution and National Endowment for the Arts have been strong advocates of the group. Recently, the Shouters received a $15,000 grant from the NEA for a Grants for Arts Projects Award, which in part supports the Gullah Geechee Education in Schools program in Title I Coastal Georgia Schools. All programs in McIntosh County are partly funded by the Georgia Council for the Arts. A low country woman's story makes national headlines. Still to come, Josephine Wright's fight for family land. Stay with us. You're watching WSAV's Honoring Black History. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Honoring Black History. Folks in the low country aren't immune when it comes to efforts to keeping their land. In fact, in 2022, a then 93-year-old Hilton Head Island woman by the name of Josephine Wright brought her plight to light as she took on a Georgia-based developer over property she said is historical and had been in her family since the end of the Civil War. I just want to keep this a sanctuary, and I believe that we will do that. So I don't even have any... Um, doubts about this is going to happen. Ms. Wright's lengthy fight garnered both local and national attention, gaining support from her community, strangers, and celebrities alike, including media mogul Tyler Perry, who promised to build her a dream home on the parcel. Sadly, Ms. Josephine passed away recently at the age of 94 before a settlement could be reached. Perry has said he will stand by his word. In a Facebook post dated January 8th, he shared in part, quote, My prayer is that you rest in peace, knowing that I will honor the commitment that I made to you. I know that you will be watching over us all as I hand those same keys to your family. Meanwhile, Miss Josephine's loved ones have taken up the mantle to keep that land in the family and give hope to those who are going through similar struggles of protecting generational wealth. WSAV's Honoring Black History continues after the break with a somber reminder of the past. We'll take you to Bullock County, where a historical marker pays tribute to lives lost during one of the darkest times in the South. Stay with us. Welcome back. Sometimes history isn't pretty. Occasionally, it can be a painful reminder of the atrocities of the past. In Statesboro, a historical marker memorializes nearly a dozen lives lost to lynching, violent, often public acts used to terrorize and control black people, particularly in the South. From 1886 to 1911, nine black men were lynched in Bullock County. Until recently, their names were left unspoken. But the work of the Statesboro Bullock Remembrance Coalition in conjunction with the national nonprofit Equal Justice Initiative is shedding new light on this dark historical truth. It brings justice to those individuals whose names are on there, but it also signifies a commitment to us working to build a better, healthier, stronger community. According to EJI, more than 4,400 black people were lynched in the United States between 1877 and 1950. Bullock is now the seventh county in Georgia to have a lynching marker, the only one south of Metro Atlanta. Now, it's also worth mentioning that in 1918, the first president of the Savannah branch of the NAACP went to Congress to argue for the passage of a federal anti-lynching bill. More than 100 years later, in 2022, a law making lynching a federal crime was finally enacted. Well, not far from the historic marker stands a memorial dedicated to a life well lived. Just last month, family members and friends of the late Loretta Johnson Williams gathered near her home for the unveiling of Loretta's Way, formerly known as Brown Street, in her honor. By all accounts, Loretta Williams helped shape lives for generations. A former substance abuse counselor, Williams went on to advocate for those struggling with addiction. She brought awareness to the problem and even created a youth organization called Statewide Minority Advocacy Group for Alcohol and Drug Prevention. Still to come, history hidden in plain sight. How Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s ties to a Savannah church were uncovered when we come back. You're watching Honoring Black History on WSAV.
Welcome back. On now to a rare piece of history hidden in plain sight. Last year, we told you the story of civil rights giant Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. speaking at a local church. His presence in Savannah and other parts of the coastal empire and low country is widely known. However, it was this video that confirmed what the pastor and parishioners of St. Paul CME long suspected. Dr. King actually stood and spoke in the pulpit of their sanctuary. But there's more to be told about the importance of this place of worship and its connection to our community. Today, we take a closer look. Whether you realize it or not, there are millions of people in this land who are poverty -stricken. It's no secret that Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. visited Savannah on several occasions. He even called it one of the most desegregated cities in the South. That's not to say that Savannah was without problems. There were marches and protests, sit-ins and wait-ins, mass incarcerations, and yes, even violence against those who dared to create change. Some would argue that Savannah's St. Paul CME, often referred to as the Paul, was a major catalyst for what was to come. Dr. King coming here, it was very interesting uh, that this was the meeting of the Southern Christian Leadership uh, Conference, which was uh, the organization he started, led, which uh, would help to uh, progress and continue his work in the civil rights movement. Quiet as kept, St. Paul has a storied past of its own that extends far beyond the civil rights movement. Reverend John Ray Thurmond is the pastor. He says the church is intertwined with African-American history in this nation in an interesting way. Those that were Methodists prior to emancipation of African-Americans uh, that were Methodist were part of white Methodist congregations. So in 1840, the members of Trinity Methodist Episcopal Church South, uh, which is down on one of the squares, uh, granted their uh, black or African-American members the opportunity to worship separately. They gave them a plot of land and that church was called Andrew Chapel, Methodist Episcopal Church. They worshiped together and it was a successful congregation for many years. During the Civil War and Sherman's march through Savannah, 20 members of the clergy and lay met with the general and Edwin Stanton, President Abraham Lincoln's Secretary of War. The pastor of Andrew Chapel was one of those ministers. The result of that meeting, Special Field Order Number 15, or what we now know as 40 Acres and a Mule. That group, Andrew Chapel, eventually became St. Paul. So our history as a church even precedes the founding of our denomination in 1870. I found a newspaper article where in 1871, St. Paul officially became a part of the CME denomination. But the Paul of the past is not the Paul of the present, at least not in the physical sense. Andrew Chapel had two locations. Uh, and then after uh, Andrew Chapel became St. Paul, we had two other locations before we came became here. So actually we're in the fifth iteration of what is now the St. Paul CME Church in the city of Savannah. So when we purchased uh, this edifice in 1964 officially, uh, it was one of the largest African-American spaces owned uh, in this city. So many uh, meetings, mass meetings were held here, but in addition to mass meetings, uh, I understand that there were concerts here and uh, it became a home for the community uh, as a place to gather and a place to grow and a place to celebrate, a place to enjoy one another. It was also a place to plan. Shortly after the property was purchased, Dr. King himself stood in the pulpit. So it was amazing. That, and, and if you kind of look at your timeline, this is shortly after uh, 1963 when he was in Washington, D.C. and stood on the, on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. We've changed the seating yes. uh, since those days in the, in the 1960s. But what we know is that uh, at one point, we believed that the church could sit over, seat over 900 people. So there were at least 1,000 people on the inside 
from what uh, some of the publications tell us. There were people outside listening through the open windows. Uh, so it was amazing, amazing uh, time for him to be here and to, uh, to inspire, uh, to lead, and to help us to get where we are today. Reverend Thurmond is the church's 48th pastor. He's been at the helm for the past 16 years. He says he's inherited a legacy of not only spreading the gospel, but being of service. I'm blessed to pastor a congregation that believes uh, that we are blessed to be a blessing. That, that, uh, so, so we use our resources on a daily basis. Uh, every single day this church feeds hungry people on the steps of the church. Every single day has students who are, participate uh, in mentoring programs uh, Monday through Friday in this building. Uh, we uh, do our best to uh, reach out uh, on the weekends and to be a place of shelter for those uh, who need some respite uh, from the, the struggles of life. But that didn't begin with me. It didn't begin with my predecessor, uh, Reverend Delaney. Uh, it's always been in the fabric of this congregation. As for what he hopes to see, Reverend Thurman says he relies on the words that Dr. King gave all of us. We will continue to move. We will bring the moral weight of the universe. Dr. King talked about the beloved community, a community where we are all uh, significant, we are all important, we are all seen, and we all have opportunities. We all have equity. And so I think that St. Paul, while we will always work uh, to build people spiritually, will always work to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, will also work uh, in our community so that uh, everyone is treated the way they should be treated. Reverend Thurman says while he thinks the future of St. Paul is bright, the work of the church that started almost 200 years ago continues. He says their focus now is on seeking justice and looking at ways to reduce poverty and improve housing in Savannah. Stay right there, just ahead, living history. Hear from the public servant who blazed the trail in law enforcement for others to follow. You don't want to miss his story after the break. Welcome back to Honoring Black History. If history isn't documented, it simply fades away. That was almost the case for James Franklin's story. In fact, you'd be hard pressed to find any details on his tenure as former chief of police for the Savannah Chatham County Board of Education, the first African American to hold that position. But by all accounts, Chief Franklin is a trailblazer. Fortunately, he's still around to share his accomplishments in his own words. If the community is decent and good to you, give back to it by trying to help somebody. James Franklin knows a lot about giving back. In fact, you could consider his life a master class in public service. At 83 years young, he's paved the way for others to follow. But his name is seemingly void of the recognition he deserves. Born in Macon but raised in Savannah, Franklin says a traumatic experience during high school graduation changed the trajectory of his life. I graduated, stopped at a, at a little filling station there in Cordillon to pick up a monetary gift for being the fastest person in track in the state. And um, there were four little white fellas sitting around a pot belly stove. And um, I asked for the owner, and they said, well, he went to get a party, he'd be right back. So I was standing there by the door, and one of the guys got up and reached in his pocket and put a 38 in my nose and cocked it and said, uh, what are you supposed to say? I said, Mama, don't drive. My daddy got two pistols. I knew he had one in his pocket, one under the front seat. I said, uh, Lord, don't let us all get killed here in Cordillo. And um, I said, you know, I said, tell Mr. Thing, you know, thank you. And uh, we'll be back. And I had the car, so let's go home. So we went on back to Savannah. And that was, but that was how I remember my graduation. And I guess from that incident, I just made up my mind that I would help people. So after finishing school, Franklin enlisted in the U.S. Air Force. If they gave me a job, a prison chaser, they called it. If they had anybody in the, you know, in the lockup, 
it was my job to take them to breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But in the process of doing that, I learned a lot of investigative techniques and a lot of ways how to do things. So, you know, when I got out of service, um, hey, um, it was just kind of right there in front of me. You know, still follow the police work. In 1965, he joined the 165th Air National Guard. Five years later, he also became an officer for the Chatham County Police Department, one of a few black members of the force at that time. He worked his way up the ranks to become an investigator in the DA's office. He was later promoted to sergeant, then deputy assistant commander of the drug squad, and ultimately lieutenant before retiring. But it wasn't long before he'd embark on a new journey. At the urging of then interim Chatham County Public School Superintendent, the late Gwendolyn Goodman, Franklin accepted a job as the chief of campus police and director of security for the Board of Education, making history as the first black person to hold that position. He also played a big part in restructuring the agency. It wasn't just about taking care of the police problem. I was trying to take care help take care of the kids. Everybody doesn't need to go to jail, you know, and all kids don't need to be put in juvenile. In 1998, Franklin hung up his hat for a third time before becoming a school counselor in Ridgeland, then working as a loss prevention manager at a home improvement chain. He later moved to the suburbs in Rinkin, where he decided to retire yet again to enjoy quality time at home with his wife. And then... The sheriff up here asked me now if I wouldn't, you know, come work with them. And so I did. I mean, I accepted that invitation. Today, you can find Chief Franklin working as a blue coat at the Springfield Courthouse, providing security at the entrance, another stop in a career that he's turned into a legacy of service. I hope the door is open to, for everybody to come in, but I enjoyed the trip, you know, and that, that's the best way for me to put it. Through his efforts, Chief Franklin has opened the door for others to follow, like former Board of Education Police Chief Ulysses Bryant and current Chief Terry Enoch. It's also important to note that Franklin was the first black president of the Savannah chapter of the Lions Club, whose motto is, coincidentally, we serve. Now, we'd be remiss if we didn't acknowledge the legacy of Chatham County's first black police chief, the late Ronald Lowe, who took the reins in 1993. During his two-year tenure, he established the first community-based precincts. His department also put officers in area middle and high schools, developed a special unit on gang activity, formed a bomb squad, and expanded its Marine Patrol. He left Chatham County in 1995 to become chief in Dayton, Ohio. Lowe passed away in 2002 at the age of 57. Stay with us. They say a picture is worth a thousand words, and one man has found an image that says so much more. You'll meet him and learn about that photo's connection to a historic moment in Savannah's civil rights movement. In Savannah, as with much of the country, the 60s was a tumultuous time. Sit-ins, wait-ins, marches and protests were familiar scenes across our landscape. During the fight for equal rights, a group of local students protested by staging wait-ins at the beach on Tybee Island. Today, the story of an ordinary teen thrust into an extraordinary movement, and he has the picture to prove it. Uh, I think that'll be me right there. Sometimes history has a way of showing up. It's kind of eerie because I lived this experience. During a recent visit to the Ralph Mark Gilbert Civil Rights Museum, Vincent Hill found the photo he'd been searching for. Summer 1963, that was the year that we decided to desegregate Tybee Island, Savannah Beach, as we know it now. And myself and two other members of the youth group for the NAACP, was dropped off in the middle of downtown Tybee Island, and we went into the water. It was Memorial Day weekend, and so the beach was very crowded. And for the first time in my life, I was really afraid for my life. Well, we were being jeered and pushed around and, you know, being surrounded, and you had no place to go. The only place you could go was in the ocean. You couldn't get, you know, you couldn't run on land because we had no transportation, you know. 
and we had no protection. The discovery was by chance, but his decision to create change in a racially divided country was a conscious choice, one heavily influenced by Savannah civil rights giant W.W. Law and the local branch of the NAACP. Mr. Law, W.W. Law, he was our neighbor and also our mail carrier. And, you know, he was a very, you know, determined man. And so he was good friends with my aunt. And so she got us involved in the movement. Hill is one of many unsung heroes, an unfamiliar name with an unforgettable legacy. He's standing next to Ben Van Clark. He's standing next to Carrie Orr. Those names of people who have already joined the ancestors. And he's showing me himself in this picture. And I was like, wow, this is great. Vonette Good Walker is the director of the museum. She works to ensure stories like Hills are documented for generations to come. The stories that people tell about the movement, if the walls could talk here, that would be amazing because a lot of these pictures that we see here, people come in, they recognize themselves, they recognize people that they know. And to actually have people come in and say, that's me in the picture when I was 13, 14, 15, you know, in the movement, and then recognize them in their adult lives and who they have become is very important to us. Though his name may be absent from these walls, Hill says he was prepared and present in the fight for justice. Now at age 75, he is one of only two surviving freedom fighters in this photo. But Hill says that wasn't his first run-in with the law. At 13, he was arrested during a sit-in for fair treatment at a downtown department store lunch counter. My first time being arrested was at a Chris counter, trying to get in, go in for lunch, and was taken to jail. And then they took me to the youth center out on Eisenhower, I think it is, or President Street, whatever that is out there. And then the second time was at Crystal's downtown on Drayton Street. And that's how my life started going to jail. However, that's not where it ends. Hill became one of the first students to desegregate Savannah High School. Seniors handpicked by Mr. Law, who would go on to change the face of public education in the city. It was also a very difficult experience at the beginning, because when you used to walk down the halls between classes, going to class and going to the gym, a lot of time I was accosted by a group of kids that would shove, you know, shove and push me. And one day I took offense to it and I stood my ground and I was just suspended for a week. But so the other kid that pushed me, he was also suspended. And after that, it never happened again. Once he graduated, he wanted to get as far away from the South as he could. He left Savannah and joined the military to fight for freedoms not afforded to black citizens. He traveled the world, moving up in rank, serving in Korea, Germany, and Hawaii, where he retired as a master sergeant and now resides. Though he says memories of his hometown are both painful and pleasant, family is why he returns every now and then each time sharing the story of how he played a role in such a pivotal point in history, one he hopes will never be erased or forgotten. I think it's very important that, you know, the history be told correctly. And I'm happy that, you know, the director of the museum is still sharing our stories with the world. So were we. Because of the commitment of protesters like Vincent Hill and countless other activists on the front lines and behind the scenes locally and on a national scale, segregation legally ended in 1964. But some would argue that it never truly disappeared. Thank you for joining us as we continue to honor black history 24-7, 365. There's an African proverb that says, as long as you speak my name, I shall live forever. As we close, we'd like to pay tribute to some of the giants we've lost over the past year. May we continue to call their names and remember their extraordinary legacies. For WSAV, I'm Kim Gusby.